You already know that it's an interior designer's responsibility to specify and locate all of the light fixtures in a space, which is the fun part. But did you know that you also need to know how all of those lights should connect and work together in a switching plan? I did it before I started studying for the NCIDQ exam. And if you're asking me, Kelsey, what the f is a switching plan and how do I read one? I'm glad you asked. In this video, I'm gonna walk you through the basics of a light switching plan. What's up designers, my name is Kelsey. I'm an NCIDQ certified interior designer and the owner of KLSY, a Manhattan-based design studio specializing in commercial spaces. My mission is to help other designers excel in their career while promoting transparency about the industry and profession. If you're starting at ground zero with lighting, a little over a year ago, I posted a Lighting 101 video where I talk about all the different types of light fixtures, color temperature, and more. So I would suggest you watch that one as well, if not first. I'll also leave that linked down in the description box. One last piece of housekeeping before we jump into the video. I am very, very excited to announce that I have officially released my very own NCIDQ cheat sheets. These cheat sheets are downloadable PDFs covering many of the topics you'll see on the practicum exam, such as ADA restroom codes, partition section details, calculating occupancy, and more. When I was studying for the exam, I actually created a version of these for myself that I kept in my purse and at my work desk to review important codes and concepts throughout the day. And I felt like they really helped me with memorization as someone who is historically not great with memorization. Ask any of my friends, I have no idea what any of their birthdays are. I also created blank versions of them to test my knowledge like mini quizzes, which I've also included in this cheat sheet package. So if you're gearing up to take the NCIDQ exam and are interested, then be sure to click the link down in the description box to sign up for my email list and get your hands on these PDFs. My hope is for these cheat sheets to be the first small piece of a much larger and more comprehensive NCIDQ study guide. And because of this, I would love all of your feedback on what you like and dislike about them, what you think is missing, and also what types of videos you want me to make next for this channel. Thank you guys so much for all of your support. And with that said, let's get into light switching. Switching, also known as circuiting, refers to how the lights in a space will be turned on and off. Switching decisions are based on the function of the light fixtures, how much individual control is needed, where the switches would be best located in the space, energy conservation needs, and the maximum electrical load requirements of any one circuit. That may seem like a lot of complicated information and this unit can get a little confusing, but once you understand the basics, solving a switching question on the NCIDQ exam is a piece of cake, I promise you. Here's an example of a light switching plan. You can see the different light fixture types drawn as different symbols. These symbols are referenced in a lighting schedule, which we will review in a future video. Those arched lines connecting one fixture to another represent the power or wires that connect fixtures in a single circuit. In the case of having multiple different types of lights and fixtures, you would typically want to separate them into different circuits to give space users more flexibility. For example, let's say you walk into a room and on the wall is a light switch panel with three switches. You flip the first switch and all of the can down lights turn on. You flip the second switch and the chandelier turns on. If you flip the third switch, then all of the wall sconces turn on. There are three different switching circuits to control this and group the three different types of light fixtures together, rather than just having one light switch that turns everything on, which is not great for maybe the type of mood that you're trying to set at the time or location of light the user needs it for. If we look at the plan shown, you'll see that there are a few different circuits. Here's one connecting these track lights on this north wall. Another is connecting all of the down lights in the room. Each circuit needs a switch, obviously, because how else are you gonna turn the lights on and off? Switches are most commonly placed next to doors, so users can easily find the switch when they walk into a dark room. Notice that if you walk into a dark room, even if it's a new room, even if you've never been in that room in your entire life, you have no idea what it looks like, you can assume that if you feel around on the wall right next to you where the door is, you'll be able to find the light switch pretty easily. You want it in arm's distance because if you've never been in a room before and it's pitch black, how are you gonna know to walk around the room to find the light switch? I'm, try I'm over explaining a very simple concept, I apologize. <laughs> These track lights here on the same circuit are controlled by one single switch. This is called a two-way switch or it's sometimes referred to as a single pole switch. 
In the case where you have two entrances in a room, say, on opposite ends, you can have two light switches, one at each door, which would be a great idea so users can access these lights from both entry points. Some other good locations for two switches are at the top and bottom of a staircase and at either end of a really long hallway. This would be called a three-way switch. These terms can be confusing because they don't refer to the number of switch locations. They instead refer to the number of conductors required to make switching possible. A conductor is basically a wire that carries electricity. Like I just mentioned, a two-way switch has two conductors. A wire that connects the electrical panel to the switch, known as a hot wire, and a wire that connects the switch to the light fixture, a load wire. In a three-way switch, you have a wire that connects to the electrical panel, a wire that connects the switch to the light, and a wire that connects the two switches in order to communicate to each other when the light has been flipped on or off. You can use the naming convention as a rule of thumb that however many switch locations you have, you will need plus one number of conductors, which means having three switching locations would be called a four-way switch, having four switching locations would be called a five-way switch. You probably would never ever have a five-way switch, but you get the idea. <laughs> Now that you know the difference between a two-way and a three-way switch, let's identify them on the plan. A switch is noted as an S on a switching plan. One S notes a two-way switch or a single pole switch. A three-way switch with two switching locations is drawn as an S with a three to refer to three-way. Again, it's rare that you will ever see this, but a four-way switch with three switching locations will be noted as S with a four and so on. On the NCIDQ exam, you may see a question that asks you to fill in the switching symbols on the plan. To do this, you would simply follow the wire circuits and see how many switches they connect to, and then place the correct symbol at the correct switch location. Be sure to label both switch locations at all three-way switches. For more information regarding lighting and switching, be sure to read chapter 15 of your NCIDQ reference manual in its entirely. If you're looking for more NCIDQ test prep videos, then check out my NCIDQ video playlist here. And if you're thinking of taking the NCIDQ exam, then don't forget to click the link down in the description box to be added to my email list and get your hands on those cheat sheets. I'll see you next time for more educational interior design content. Thanks for watching and happy studying.